Hey, how you doing? My name is Patrick Long. I'm a ex-Porsche factory driver, two-time winner in the GT class at the 24 Hour of Le Mans. I'm here to walk you through a little bit of simulator trading in the 992 GT3 Cup car from Porsche. Most of today will apply to any type of simulator, something state-of-the-art like this CXC rig here, which is full motion, completely cockpit adjustable, or a basic off-the-shelf simulator. The most important thing is, is that you have a high-quality set of hardware, your steering wheel, your pedals, and your chassis that are all synced up. They're rigid. They allow you to completely immerse yourself in the hardware so that then you can focus on your job on screen. Just like a race car, it is so important where your body starts. When you get into your sim, first thing you wanna think about is that distance. How close is the steering wheel? How close is the pedals? You'll see with the CXC Motion 2 that everything uh, pedal and steering related moves in one. Today we're running the Formula steering wheel from CXC. Uh, great quick release hub, again, all authentic racing hardware. I like to have about a wristwatch length between the top spoke of the steering wheel and your wrist. You have a slight bend in your knee, even when you're at full throttle. No straight legs, but also not crouched up where you're gonna have your knee getting in between your steering. As you can see, the CXC Sim has a nice rock back, which is very realistic for the GT3 Cup car and a lot of different race cars that I've driven. This rig has a tensioner setup on the seatbelt. So the way I'm gonna set up today is just like in a real race car. I'm first gonna get my lap belt set tight. You wanna be really rigid, pulled right back against the back of the seat, get your hips tight, keep that center lap belt low, and then plug in your shoulder belts, sort of setting them up to come vertically straight down your body. Um, in this rig, I'm probably 75% of what I would have in a race car just enough that there's not really any excess slack. Everything is very much set up for a driver by drivers. That authenticity not only gives you uh, a full immersion, but it's also just a really nice piece of hardware. The great thing about the Motion 2 is they give you these auxiliary buttons and you can customize them yourself. With the CXC rig, they already have a lot of these knobs and steering wheel buttons pre-programmed in. Steering, resistance, Amount of lock is super important. Braking force adjustment. The great thing here is we're running a full hydraulic, real bottom feed pedal setup. I'm gonna run a decently hard brake pressure setting in this design with the 992 GT3 Cup. It's a non ABS setting in the game. And with that, you wanna have a lot of feel and a modulation ability, because of course, if the front wheel is locked, you wanna be able to trail out of that brake. But of course, if you're in a big aero section and you wanna add a lot of braking force, you'll be able to do that. Another in cockpit adjustability is vibration. Basically curbs, dropping wheels, making contact with another car. You want a little bit of force. There's a kicker in the back of the seat and I can adjust that here in cockpit. Race cars have stiff springs, stiff dampers. Uh, there's not a lot of travel. Personally, I like to run less travel with a little bit faster, higher frequency setting. And the great thing is, depending on the track, depending on the driver, that is all available to you uh, right here in cockpit. A great advancement in sim racing is a second tier V-Box, where you can actually record your sim racing and then send it out to a coach, compare notes with another driver, recording your in-driving video as well as telemetry. A really key setting in game for iRacing are track conditions and weather. Once you go into the menu, there's a lot of different variables here and it makes a huge difference, not only in how the car reacts to tire wear, how it handles, but also the lap time that you're going to produce. First of all, in setting weather, you've got three different options of your overall uh, condition. Then you move down through temperature, humidity, wind speed, initial weather variation, ongoing weather variation. So it gets very specific looking at the different setups in game. First thing we'll talk about is force feedback. Uh, we have two key settings that I like to focus on. First of all, the strength, the amount of force feedback that's actually being produced and given to the driver. And then the second setting being wheel force. We have 16 newton meters of max wheel force. So we set those two parameters, bookending what you wanna use and how much your hardware can give you.
So as I mentioned, 2023, the 992 version, the latest iteration of the GT3 Cup car from Porsche. If you go into your chassis setup and really how you can engineer the car, starting at tires and aero, each of your individual contact patches or tires, you have a starting pressure, your last hot pressure from the previous session, your temperatures across the spread of inner shoulder, middle of the tire and outer, and then how much tread was remaining in that session based on how long you ran and how much wear you were producing with your tire. This is a great place to really look at how the tires are reacting and behaving from the previous session. And then of course, the one thing that you can adjust is your starting pressures based on the feedback and the learnings and understandings that you had from your previous session. On the chassis page, quite a few different settings here. Some are limited based on the car that you have in iRacing. Some things are locked by spec because that's actually how it is in real life. For instance, in the cup cars, you can't change the spring. Here we start in the front uh, with your anti-roll bar settings, how stiff you want your anti-roll bar, really that relationship of lateral uh, anti-roll and how the relationship of one tire to the other behaves. If you think about anti-roll, traction, turn-in, mechanical grip at a kind of fine-tuning aspect versus bigger wholesale changes such as spring rates, ride heights, aero, etc. Your toe, fuel level, how much fuel you're running in the car, that might be a strategy thing based on how long the race is or if you're taking fuel out of the car to run lighter for qualifying. Cross weight is really just a reading based on some of the other calibrations or settings that you're running with your suspension. Corner weights, ride heights, spring perch offset, camber. These are all things that I've set up and fine tuned, not so much for a track specific or optimum lap time, but something that you can use for training from track to track to track. One thing I find in iRacing is there's so much time investment in really tuning a car for ultimate pace or race pace and making your tires last. Find something that works for you. This setup will be in the comments below and you can utilize that and maybe you'll love it, maybe you won't. But basically what I've done is set up a car that's reactive enough to braking and trail braking. There's still a little more understeer for mid quarter to exit, especially on throttle than I would prefer or would say is ultimately how one of these cars handles, but it does the trick for training. So now sitting in pit lane in the car, one thing that I like to fine tune to different cars with inside of iRacing or other softwares is the view, the depth, how far back you're sitting from the steering wheel, how high the driver is in relationship to steering and dash and how zoomed in or out you are. Um, on this sim, again, it's great to have cockpit adjustability because I can make these on the fly or quickly without leaving uh, the game and going back into the garage. So pushing the view button and then first thing I'm going to look at is field of view, both backing up, which is the plus button of the FOV button, and then the actual tilt of the driver. And then the last one is the height of the driver in relationship head to dash. So today we're talking about the next stop on the Carrera Cup North America Tour, Indianapolis Motor Speedway, one of the most famous racetracks in the world. You don't need any background on this place. The interesting thing about the Grand Prix track that was developed for Formula One in the early 2000s is we're running counter direction up the front straightaway into a lot of flat, tight corners. I'm gonna take you for a little bit of a slow cruise around, a track walk uh, to give you a little bit of perspective. As you can see, pit lane exit, the racetrack is only separated by a white line. So you wanna definitely stay driver's right of the white line, setting up for a little bit of a chicane inside of the turn one apex, keeping an eye on the white line here, driver's left, lead up on the speed, keep yourself driver's right, leave a lane for any oncoming traffic that may be at speed. This is the turn two and three complex, and we'll get right into it here in the first key corner of the racetrack, which is turn four. Braking is earlier than you think. The pedal pressure is maximum three out of five. You'll see where I'm set up right now. What I'm trying to do is establish a straight, a deadline straight braking section to give the car the most amount of lateral grip without having any lean in the car because in game, in iRacing, it's pretty easy to lock that inside wheel. So 
three out of five, good solid hit of brake. You don't need to do a lot of deceleration here. The line is really heading to the left outside edge of the track before you bend it in. You're pretty much already to maintenance throttle here just to put a little bit of load and traction into the rear. My apex is right at the exit of this curve, which sets me up for this high speed chicane turns five and six. The line through five and six for me at speed is to sort of straight line five and then to just nip six. Six is a much taller curb than five, so you can take a lot of it if you need it. I remain committed at speed to full throttle, even if I'm putting half the car over the apex curb of turn six. But as you see, the difference between five and six is a lot more height. It's one of those sort of removable curbs, if you will. And then the other note here is the exit of six. You have a lot of racetrack that iRacing won't call track limits on. Depending on the rules of IMSA, and the race director and stewards, they may and likely will let you run four wheels over the white line, but you'd have to watch that if you're heading to this racetrack in real life. Set up far right, nice and early. Again, straight hands, about the 500 board, hard initial hit, four and a half out of five, bleeding the speed down. Don't get caught out by turn seven. It's slower than you think, another late apex, but it's really about deceleration and getting your brake zone really dialed in. So I'm bleeding off from four and a half to three to two. And as my hands move in, maybe one out of five on pedal pressure. I'm only half to three quarters out on the exit of seven, setting up for very low grip in turns seven and eight. Late apexes, right front tire on the curb of seven and of eight. Little squirts of throttle, second gear or the bottom of third gear. Another key corner like turn four, this is turn 10. I like to clip around the outside as late as possible on the apex so that it gives me nice straight hands for the exit of 10. Probably grabbing fourth gear right at the exit. You can run the white line. There's a little bit of a curve, but I can't rely on it. Turn 11 is just a late apex clip. Uh, it's a kink flat out. Don't use all the banking drivers left in unless you really need to. Again, creating straight line braking. So I'm kind of grabbing the middle of what is essentially turn two or, or the short shoot between two, one and two at Indianapolis before the back straightaway. But regardless of that, set up for turn 12. You see the first braking board being a three. In other parts of this racetrack, there's even an 800 board. So don't get caught out with the braking boards at Indianapolis, do a slow lap. Look at the numbers, you won't see them at speed very clearly, at least I won't, but um, 300 board is probably too late. So whatever you think is your break point for turn 12, back it up 150 feet and then lean into a little bit more uh, late braking exercise. Again, tall curb at the apex, so I'm not using it. Um, again, only about three quarters distance out on exit line hustling the car back over for turn 13. The key here is to remember that in 13, you think you've got it set up, you think you're on line, you go to power and then you're in the grass on the exit. So you'll see as we bend around this corner, the decreasing radius of the corner means that you have to have an extra sharp and crisp turn in. Car positioning is everything at this racetrack. As you see, the, the right side curb is sort of heading towards you and it will catch you out. I've had many very good laps here that have been ruined by lazy mental strength through turns 13. 14 is your final corner. My narrative here is late apex. I don't need to be right down on the apex curb of 14, but I'm sort of just letting it out past the metal opening in the wall, front straightaway, across the bricks. That's one lap at slow speed, talking about those late apexes and getting those inside front tires touching the curbs. Now let's go into a little bit more speed so that you can see the flow of this lap. Indianapolis, wide, long front straightaway, but it narrows up into turn one, braking at about the 650 board, hard initial hit of braking. It's gonna feel very slow. You're almost at a creep into turn one apex. Touch that apex curb, be tidy on your lines through two. Three is really about setting up for straight hands into turn four. Turn four is earlier braking and it's a slower corner than you think, but it allows you to be right on that apex driver's right, early to throttle, fourth gear, 
top of fourth gear through the exit. When you're on a real burner, you'll be grabbing fifth earlier than this lap. Hustle the car back over right. Keep in mind, these braking boards come up quick. At about the 600 board, you better be hard into it. Stay after your braking right down to that flat apex of turn seven. You can kind of bounce it off the limiter here in second gear using a little bit of trail brake to dig the front in. Turn 10 is really key. Early throttle is just a long run up through 11 to turn 12. Let the car drivers left all the way out, but know that that curb is narrow. In 11 here, don't be lazy and run all the way up to the wall. It's about mid track, but the wall will come towards you. It's early, early braking into 12 because the 300 board is way too late for your brake point into 12. 13 is about patience, late apex because the course, the racetrack is coming up towards you drivers, right? And then turn 14, once you get good track position, you can be flat out all the way through 14, but you have to work on your line through there and watch the bump at the apex. That's one lap at the Brickyard. This is gonna be a fun race for the Career Cup North America guys. So final thoughts for Indianapolis. I think turn four, turn seven, and turn 12 are key break points. This game really awards a big initial hit of braking because the logic is the speed is high, therefore the arrow is high, and the locking of front brakes is less likely. So using that in-game strategy, you really want to crush that initial hit of braking and you want to have straight hands and be really early. It's so easy to outbreak yourself because this is an infield sort of modified oval. And with that, you've got a lot of flat corners. You've got some flat curbs and some tall curbs in all of it in game and in reality. You really want to be disciplined with your front tire positioning where your apex is, whether it's a traditional mid middle apex or it's a late apex, which a lot of times in a 911, it's a later clip. You've got a little bit higher center of gravity, a little bit more weight. So you want to have those hands straight so that you can get after that throttle. You want all that weight evenly distributed over the front when you're braking and over the rear when you're accelerating. So you'll see a lot of my lines are, are very triangular. It's, a, it's an abrupt direction change and then getting after that throttle and accelerating out of the corner. I love this racetrack at first. It, it comes off as a little bit Mickey Mouse, a little bit too low speed and, and waiting for it. But once you get into a rhythm here in real life, it's super rewarding. It races well. It rewards a driver who thinks two corners ahead and protects their tires. Good luck to everybody, whether you're racing in-game or in real life here uh, at Indianapolis.